All right, welcome to another fireside chat from FutureView. Uh, today, I'm I'm here with Brian McGrath, one of the co-founders of FutureView, and I thought we'd introduce ourselves a little bit um, and and talk about some of the some how how FutureView kind of came to to start. And uh, just as quick background, uh, I've been a CFO for a long a long time, and uh, in the most recent two companies before founding FutureView, I had the, the good fortune to work with Brian as the head of FP&A. And over that period, one of the things that we realized was that um, we got a lot faster at setting up good FP&A processes. And part of that was because we understood that FPAs, FP&A has changed a little bit. And, but Brian, why don't, we start, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit and, and then let's, uh, let's jump in from there. Sure. Yeah. So uh, Brian McGrath, I've been working in finance for uh, going on 18 years now uh, in various capacities, all uh, within what I like to refer to as kind of operational finance. So really looking forward, trying to understand the trends of the business, understand, um, you know, the metrics, the things that drive the decision making at the company uh, and figuring out how to use those most efficiently and effectively at small companies uh, to help fuel decision making. Yeah. And it's one of, one of the things that uh, Brian brings to FP&A that I, I think I've begun to realize over the last uh, decade or so was indispensable was an understanding of, tech, of technology and how that applies to FP&A because at least way back when, when I started, FP&A was sort of just a smart person with a, a calculator and a spreadsheet put, putting together analyses. Mm -hmm. It, the whole role's changed. Talk about, I mean, the kind of data you deal with. Now. Yeah, I mean, I kind of, I lived it. Uh, you know, when we were at Channel Advisor, I had to, I didn't know all the technology stuff. I had to yeah. learn it. Um, and the reason I had to learn it is to really understand the performance of the business. Uh, and this is true of every company that we've worked with since. The amount of data that you had to sift through was yeah. too big for Excel. I mean, I grew up in finance, you know, just like, you know, the traditional role that you talked about, right? You get some data, you get some financial data, you do some good financial analysis, you build some good metrics off of it, you try to kind of explain drivers and things like that. But when you start getting to, you know, data sets that are large, right. uh, too large for Excel, you can't do that just in Excel. You need that intermediary layer of a database or some sort of technology or some sort of kind of large data, uh, data warehouse, data lake, data model, whatever you want to call it. But some sort of ability to turn that operational data into something that can be consumed in an analysis. And that's a skill set that FP&A has had to build because yeah. FP&A in its ideal sense is taking all of that operational data and the financial data and merging it together in a way that helps drive those decisions. If you don't understand the technology and the, the, the handling of large volumes of data in a way that you can actually facilitate that, you're gonna spend all of your time just wrangling data and not driving yeah. insights back into the business. So it's a matter of necessity, I think, for FP&A professionals to really learn how to use large data sets effectively. You know, you're always going to need some technical help, right? Because right. those data sets can get so large that, you know, it really takes like a data scientist or somebody really skilled in BI to, to manage it. Um, but you need to be able to get as far down the path by yourself as you can. All right, answer, answer a question. You touched on something there that is, I'm curious. Everybody uses this, um, this phrase data lake. And I, I, I understand what a database is, and what exactly is a data lake? I don't try to bifurcate between a data warehouse, a data lake, a data model, a data set. Um, you know, I think people use the, there are technical definitions of those, mm -hmm. but in practice, what people are talking about is places where data comes together right. so that you can access it all in one place, right? Okay. And the amount of logic that's put on top of that or how it's stored, how it's organized, you know, how often it's updated, all that kind of stuff is, is a little bit superfluous. I think what's important is that you have a place where all of your data is coming together for finance to be able to leverage it and not have to worry about all of that. So I don't, it doesn't matter whether you call it a data warehouse, a data lake, a database, you know, it's, it needs to bring the data together. A place where it all comes in, in one, one yeah. place and can be processed efficiently. And, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, it's a, you know, if you think of Salesforce and NetSuite and SaaS Optics and, mm -hmm. you know, whatever other data sets you have, potentially your own, you know, platform data, um, if every time you want to analyze the performance of the business, you're having to go and extract manually reports and then munge them together in Excel, you're not, you're not operating at the level of efficiency you could be. A data warehouse, a data lake should, uh, whatever you want to call it, should be bringing that data together so that it's at your fingertips mm -hmm. and you're not having to redo the same efforts over and over again to, to leverage it. All right, so I love, I love that word, munge. So what do you mean? When you say munge that stuff together in Excel, what do you mean? <laughs> That's a technical term for transforming <laughs> data in Excel so that it's useful. Munging okay. just means like just grinding through it. You so, know, it's the, it, it, you know, you pull, you got a bunch of data sheets and you're, you know, cleaning the data up and you are merging it together with VLOOKUPs and indexes and offsets and all the, you know, technical Excel formulas. Um, but it's just a manual process of smashing it together. Got it. Got it. And this is what Excel, this is why you end up with these monstrous Excel Mm -hmm. spreadsheets with everything that ever exists. Yeah, there. because you end up in a place where you're trying to download every transaction out of Salesforce, every transaction out of NetSuite, every transaction out of the platform, and then you're building links, building bridges between those data sets to try mm -hmm. to say, okay, I booked a dollar of revenue over here in Salesforce. How did that customer, hopefully there is a customer in NetSuite, how did that customer's revenue actually get recognized off of it? And then, you know, what's the activity on the on our platform to try to understand how the activity is driving the revenue and how does the revenue yeah. that got recognized match up with the bookings that we expected? All that stuff, the, all of those data sources come from disparate systems, right? Okay. And if every time you're trying to analyze that data, you're exporting all of those data sets and bringing them into Excel, which has limited ability to handle large amounts of data, you're, you're, not, you're not optimizing your time. You're redoing you're, the same things over and over again. You've got to create, a, it must create a lot of, I'm, I'm thinking of one time where we had, uh, who was it, the uh, payroll, we were doing commissions, mm -hmm. and I won't even say the company, but uh, better, but we were, we were doing commissions and, and all the commissions were wrong because someone had exported the data from the CRM and mm -hmm. missed, it, missed the, the paste by a co one column width. Mm -hmm. So none of the currencies translated right and all the commissions came out wrong. It was a huge, uh, and it was yeah. such a tiny little thing. They just pasted it in the wrong place. So. Yeah, and sometimes that's not even within your control, right? You're necessarily within your control. You're using a shared report. You know, let's say there's a commissions report out of Salesforce that everybody knows is the source of truth. And you've copied and pasted that, you know, downloaded that report for 12, 18 months in a row. Everybody's using it. And somebody goes in and adds a column to that report because it's interesting for them. You don't mm -hmm. notice that they added a column. And your Excel formulas don't necessarily compensate for dynamically looking up where the column you want are. They just go over 10 columns and pull whatever's there. Yeah. If there's another column in there, it's not the column you thought it was going to be, yeah. right? Yeah. So those are the types of errors that Excel is, um, is prone okay. to that a basic data warehouse, data lake, you know, data model architecture compensates for because it's looking for specific inputs. Right. It used to drive me crazy when I would send out budget templates and no matter how carefully you gave instructions, do not change the template. Someone would always change the template because their, their department somehow was too unique to be sure. captured in your template and then your whole thing is, is messed up. Yeah, and in many uh, cases, every department is unique, right? And mm -hmm. you need that flexibility and that's the great thing about Excel is that it's flexible, um, but it's the bad thing about Excel as well. Is it, super, it's flexible, super. you can make it do whatever you want. So, so I still, I'm, I'm, you know, I have a lot of friends who are old school CFOs mm -hmm. and they're like, Excel works fine. It's worked fine for me. Why does Excel break down, uh, you know, as a, as a tool for pulling together forecasts and budgets and things like that? What, what, what? Because that? in order to make it, it can work fine, mm -hmm. right? And it, and for one person or a small group of highly effective advanced Excel users, it can work perfectly fine. The problem is that it needs to work for everybody and not right. everybody's going to be at the advanced level of skill set in Excel, whether they're in finance or not. Right. Um, 
and the more sophisticated your business gets, the more sophisticated your model needs to get. And that is, you know, and the more sophisticated you get in Excel, the more prone you are to making mistakes. Right. Not right. you, you know, individually, but you as an organization. Because right. as you scale, you're not the only one that's going to be doing that. Somebody else has to manage that that's model true. or a team of people have to manage that model or inputs to that model. Um, and it becomes very brittle that way.